Hi everyone, welcome to SBS 304 Research Methods Lab. So today we're going to talk about lab exercise 6 on materials-based research. So materials-based research is also called content analysis research and it's basically asking research questions and doing analyses on materials that were not necessarily created for research purposes. They may have been created for other purposes. Um, they may have been created with the awareness that research could be done on them, um, but they, they weren't data collected for research purposes. So your book actually admits of some overlap between materials-based research and secondary data analysis uh, with data sets like the General Social Survey. Um, for our purposes, we're going to talk about materials-based research as research on materials not created for research purposes. So uh, the examples in this project are uh, a project where people can create kind of self-narratives on their racial identity, the race card project, uh, interviews created to preserve oral histories of the ACT UP movement uh, around AIDS, HIV AIDS, the New York Public Library recipe collection, which is a collection of digitized recipes throughout history, uh, and the propaganda poster collection, which is a collection of World War I propaganda posters from the United States. Um, so none of these materials, neither recipes nor uh, propaganda posters, nor necessarily race uh, identity narratives or act up oral history narratives were created for us to do research on. Um, they were generally created to preserve history uh, and to reflect opinions. Um, or in the case of recipes, they were created to tell people how to cook food. Or propaganda posters were created to uh, inspire people to political beliefs or action. Um, so these are the benefit of doing materials-based research or content analysis research is that the materials themselves are what we call inert, uh, where we have to worry about things like selection bias or observation effect or things like that when we're doing research with human subjects. When we do materials-based research, the propaganda posters don't care what your question is. The, uh, the recipes aren't going to suffer from acquiescence bias. They're not going to agree with you or tell you what you want to hear. Um, these materials are inert to research, so they're not going to react to you. Um, they're just there. They're just what they are. So that's a major benefit. Another major benefit is that these materials supersede living memory. They exist outside of the time space that we are in. So the race card project is very contemporary. Uh, and the ACT UP Oral Histories project is recent, but the fact is that many of the people interviewed in the ACT UP Oral Histories project have since died. Uh, they were people living with HIV AIDS, and many of them have died already, uh, even though the project was only done between 10 and 20 years ago. Um, the recipe collection spans back to the 1700s and beyond. And the propaganda poster collection is from World War I. It's from 1914 through 1917. So uh, you're going to see a lot of things that exist historically uh, and not kind of in living memory or living experience. So what I want you to do is choose one of the following collections, or I've called them databases because that's how they tend to be organized. The race card project is organized more like a blog, um, but everything else is more like a database. So I want you to choose one of the following collections um, of materials. I want you to state a research question or hypothesis that you could answer or test using the collection you've chosen. Uh, I want you to create a sampling frame or a purposive sampling strategy for the collection. I want you to sample at least 30 elements, uh, but that doesn't mean you're limited to 30. Uh, you may have a much more interesting and enjoyable experience if you sample more than 30. Um, 
and then I want you to type your answers to the questions below. Uh, just asking you about what you've chosen, your, your sampling strategy, uh, and how you'll know if you've confirmed or nullified your hypothesis. So I want to give you a little uh, overview of some of what you might be looking at. Uh, so I'm going to follow. So I'm just going to talk you through an example as if I were doing this project myself. So we're going to talk about the race card project. Um, and that's because I research uh, race and ethnicity. Not, uh, not all the time, but that's one of my research interests. So um, I'm going to state a research question or hypothesis that I can answer using the, the collection I've chosen. So I'm going to choose the race card project as my collection. Uh, and a question I'm interested in, uh, my standpoint for researching race and ethnicity is generally whiteness, uh, because that's where I, that's who I am. Um, that's how I, how I approach race and ethnicity research uh, is as a white woman. Uh, and so it makes the most sense for me to research the concept of whiteness. Um, so my uh, hypothesis or kind of research question is, uh, will white folks um, in, the, in the collection uh, reflect negativity and defensiveness? And I'm going to... Um, I'm going to operationalize negativity as kind of um, dislike for white identity or uncomfortableness with white identity and defensiveness as the opposite of that. Kind of, um, I'm white and I feel that people don't like me because I'm white. So negativity would be kind of personal distaste for white identity. And defensiveness would be a feeling that others have distaste for white identity. Um, so I think those are two emotions I'm going to encounter um, when sampling folks who identify as white. So um, next, I'm going to create a sampling strain, uh, sampling frame or purposive sampling strategy. So I'm going to choose the first 30 people who identify as white um, that I can find. That's my sampling strategy. It's not a sampling frame because I don't know exactly how many elements there are uh, and because I don't have kind of a, a complete list of people who identify as white. So for example, I may miss some people who identify as white because they don't say that. Um, not everyone says outright, I'm this race, ethnicity, or I have this identity. Uh, some people just, uh, take for granted that you can tell by a picture. Uh, and I could in fact choose to code people who look white as white. Uh, I'm going to choose not to do that. I'm going to choose not to code people into whiteness based on their appearance because that's really problematic. Um, and that's one of the themes of the, the race card project is actually erasure of different ethnic identities because people look white or pass for white. Uh, so I'm going to choose deliberately not to code anyone into my sample based on uh, appearance. I'm going to wait for them to explicitly say I am white. Um, so um, my sampling strategy is to choose the first 30 people who explicitly say that they're white that I encounter. Um, so then I'm going to try to answer the first 30 questions. Or, sorry, I'm going to try to answer questions about those first 30 people uh, who identify as white. Um, so the collection I've chosen is the Race Card Project. My research question or hypothesis is that those who identify as white will express either negativity about white identity or defensiveness about white identity. Um, the variables I will measure are whiteness. Do they identify as white? 
uh, negativity? Do they express distaste for white identity and defensiveness? Do they express kind of a sense of displaced pride about white identity or a sense that other people dislike them based on their white identity? Um, how will I know if my hypothesis has been confirmed or nullified? So we, we don't say that a hypothesis has been disconfirmed. We simply say that we failed to confirm it. Um, another way to say that is that we have nullified the hypothesis, meaning null is Latin for empty. So a, a null set is an empty set, right? So um, null means empty. So if we have nullified the hypothesis, it just means we don't have enough evidence to confirm it. It doesn't mean it's definitely false. Uh, it just means we don't know if it's true yet. Um, it's a very optimistic way to look at hypotheses. So uh, how will I know if my hypothesis has been confirmed or nullified? I'm going to say that if at least 20 people out of the 30 I, I, I sample uh, express either negativity or defensiveness, that my hypothesis is confirmed. Um, and if fewer than 20 people express defensiveness or negativity, I will accept the null hypothesis. That is, I'll accept that there's not enough evidence to support my hypothesis. Um, how many elements are in my collection? I'm not sure. According to the About section of the Race Card Project blog, uh, there are at least 500, or there are at least 500,000. So, Lots and lots and lots. How many elements will I sample? 30. Um, how will I choose which elements to sample? My criterion is people who explicitly identify as white. Um, and where, how, where were, was I able to confirm or nullify my hypothesis? It remains to be seen, but that's a question I'll need to answer. So uh, I'll state my hypothesis above, and then I will, um, I will tell whether I have confirmed or nullified my hypothesis. So that's the whole project. Um, that's all I'm asking you to do. I will make an exception to the project that if you choose the ACT UP Oral Histories project, I'll only ask you to sample 10 interviews, not 30 because they're very long. Um, so I, want to, I don't want to discourage you from using this wonderful collection of materials. Uh, it's really remarkable, uh, but it's really, the interviews tend to be about an hour long, uh, which is several pages of transcription. Uh, so if you, um, if you choose um, the ACT UP Oral Histories Project, uh, now, bearing in mind, depending on what your variables are, you may not have to read the entire transcript. You could do a, a keyword search, for example, of the transcript. Still, I'll only ask you to sample 10 different interviews if you choose to use the ACT UP Oral Histories Project. So keep that in mind. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, to relate to a really powerful social movement. Uh, if you choose that one, I encourage you to read uh, to do some, you know, quick Googling on the ACT UP movement. Um, it's, uh, it's famously uh, a focus of the, the play Rent, um, but it was, a, it was a really um, powerful social movement in the 80s and 90s. So uh, in memorable history, but almost lost to memory because of the mortality of the people who, who participated. So uh, I encourage you to look at all these very interesting collections, choose one that works for you, and let me know if you have any questions or challenges. Have a good time.